In 2018, the Dallas Fuel came into the Overwatch League's inaugural season with a lot of momentum. Made up of the entire roster of the most decorated Western team in history, and some new players to give them more flexibility, there was no reason to think that this wasn't one of the best teams in the league. They were also seen as the only Western team that was likely to compete against the Korean powerhouses made up of players from the top Apex teams. However, in spite of their talent and years spent playing together, the Fuel's debut season was one filled with disappointment. In a 40-game regular season, they only managed to win 12 games, and at times they looked like one of the worst teams in the league. But this was not always the case. I can remember this team having some memorable series throughout the year where they played some insanely high-quality Overwatch. They took some of the best teams in the world to the limit, yet they couldn't even manage to win half their games. So, why is that? What happened to these guys? Well, that is what I'm here to find out. My mission is to watch all 40 of the Fuel's regular season games to see if I can pinpoint the issues that plague this team and cause them to fall apart so spectacularly. Some of these issues will be pretty obvious. Others may be harder to identify. At the end of this retrospective, I hope that we can all have a better understanding of what happened to this team. So grab a snack, sit back, and get comfortable, because we're going to be here for a while. Before we dive into the regular season, I would like to give a short history lesson as to why this team was regarded so highly. For anyone who is new and is maybe curious about why these players were seen the way they were. If you already know Envious' story, I'm sure that future me will put a timestamp somewhere in here that you can skip to. If you're still here, let's go back in time to 2016. Long before the Overwatch League was a concept in Blizzard's eye, Envious was already making a claim as the best team in the world. Their roster was stacked with some of the game's earliest superstars at every role. Going to tournaments weekly, they would win a staggering 57 matches in a row, and it didn't look like anyone could stand up to them. However, they would finally meet their match when they played some of the top European teams, Rogue and Misfits. After losing to both of them, Envious was still considered to be the best team in North America, but not exactly the best team in the world. They would relinquish that title to Rogue, who would continue their dominance at the APAC Premier, where they would take down South Korea's best team, Lunatic High. Wanting to prove the doubters wrong, Envious would have a chance to do so when OGN invited them to the first season of their new series called Apex. Envious and three other top Western teams had been invited to compete in the top 16 group stages of their tournament. The other 12 were Korean teams that had to play through qualification stages to make it in. Envious would only lose to Lunatic High en route to making it to the top 8 bracket as the second seed of their group. Apex's top 8 format was similar to that of Overwatch League's current May Melee and Summer Showdown tournaments, where the higher seeded teams would get to choose their opponent from the lower seats. Rogue would controversially choose to play Envious even though weaker teams were still on the board. When asked why, DPS player AKM said that Envious was only the best team in North America, and whenever they would play against another top-level team, they would always lose. That and the fact that there were rumors about some inner turmoil going on with their roster. The usually vocal Taimu had no rebuttal and simply said that everything AKM said was technically true. The aforementioned inner turmoil was surrounding DPS player Tailspin. Plainly put, Tailspin felt that most of his teammates were not putting in the effort needed to secure a championship. There was no bad blood between him and most of his teammates, with the exception of Taimu. Tailspin made it clear that he did not care for his DPS partner. When he made his farewell statement in a twit longer, he had pleasant things to say about all of his teammates. Multiple pleasant things at that. But the only nice thing he had to say about Taimu was that he has good aim. Now needing a new DPS player, Team Captain Internet Hulk told the higher-ups at Envy that he already knew which player the team needed, a young player from Thailand named Nikki. The funny thing was that Mickey wasn't a DPS player at all. He was a D.Va player. When Mickey was added to the team, the players needed to shuffle their roster around to make him fit. Harry Hook would be swapped to DPS, Internet Hulk would take over for him at main support, and Mickey would become the team's new off-tank. Alright, look, this should have been a death sentence for Envious. Going into the top 8 of the biggest Overwatch tournament to date, they had to bring in a new player who they had never played with before, had to shuffle half their roster around just to make the signing even work, and their quarterfinals opponent on top of all of this was the best team in the world. However, none of that seemed to matter. Mickey blended into the team perfectly, and they somehow upset Rogue in a nail-biting Map 5 series 3-2. In the semifinals, they would do the same against the rising stars of Kongdu Uncia. 
The grand finals was an anti-climax, with Envious trouncing a Freaka Freaks Blue 4-0 to take home the first ever Apex crown. Two weeks later, Envious would travel back to North America to compete at MLG Vegas 2016. They crushed their competition, never dropping a game and only losing a single map for the entire tournament. It was safe to say that they were once again the best team in the world. Entering Apex Season 2, however, some holes in the roster would begin to present themselves. For starter, the triple tank comp that they dominated was being pushed out of the meta in favor of the faster, more mobile dive comp, which centered around heroes like Genji, Tracer, and Winston, none of which were heroes that Envious could play very well. This meant that they were stuck playing an inferior composition for the entire turn. In spite of their inability to play dive, Envious was still able to win the majority of their matches due to the superior teamwork and ult economy. And when all else failed, Mr. Good Aim and Harry Hook would take turns popping off, making heroic plays when the team needed them the most. They would make it to top 8, but would quickly be bounced by Lunatic High and Kongdu Uncia in loser's bracket to exit with a respectable top 8 finish. In Apex Season 3, some changes were made to the roster. Wanting to try his hand at coaching, Internet Hulk decided not to renew his contract. Envious saw an opportunity to improve their DPS line, so they moved Harry Hook back to main support and had their eye on the bench of a player from one of the Korean teams. Meta Athena had an aspiring young Tracer player named Effect. Effect was already starting level material, but when the DPS players in front of you are Saya player in his prime and the flex got himself Libero, you're just not going to see very much playtime. Effect was actually going to sign with Lunatic High as a backup. This was technically a lateral move, but Lunatic High's biggest struggle came with their DPS players, so Effect would have had a better chance earning a starting role with them rather than his current team. But when Envious granted him a guaranteed starting position, he opted out of that signing to go with them instead. And Effect made immediate improvements to this team's dive composition. Along with Coco, who used the break to improve his Winston, all of a sudden, Envious could play dive at a competitive level. They would upset Meta Athena in group stages and make it into top 8 as the first seed of their group. And for the first time, they would be allowed to pick who their first round opponent would be. Envious would pick a young upstart team called X6 Gaming to be their round 1 opponent. However, in a back and forth game 5 series, they would fall. Knocked down into loser's bracket, they would not be allowed to lose again if they wanted to win another Apex crown. They would defeat Meta Athena once again and get the revenge on X6 Gaming, defeating them 3-0 to make it into the semifinals as the lower of two seeds from Group A. Sadly, this is where Envious's magical run would end, as their semifinals opponent was the scariest team in the entire tournament, Kongdu Panthera. Seriously, even in 2020, the core of this roster could make a top 10 team in the world. In 2017, they seemed unstoppable. Fisher would put on one of the best main tank performances that I have ever seen, shutting down both Effect and Taimu for the entire game almost single-handedly. Envious would fall to KDP 4-0 and would finish in 4th place. Envious would not compete in Apex Season 4 for a couple of different reasons. First of all, the players had been away from home for quite a while, so I can only imagine that they were getting homesick. Secondly, I believe OGN did not want to invite any Western teams to the Season 4 tournament, wanting it to be composed entirely of Korean teams, though I'm not entirely sure if this is true or not. Finally, Blizzard had recently announced that they were planning to start a globally sanctioned league for their new game, the Overwatch League. Envious was interested in being signed to one of the 12 franchises and decided to go back to the States to compete in Overwatch Contenders North America. They would also sign Flex DPS player Siegel to the team on September 23rd to give them a high-level Genji and Farah play that they had been missing since Tailspin made his departure. Envious would crush their NA competition, winning all seven of their qualification matches while only dropping four maps throughout. Going into the semifinals, Envious would continue to dominate, bullying FNR GFE 3-0 and then dismantling FaZe Clan 4-0 in the grand finals to bring home their third major trophy in two years. Well, we're all caught up now. After dominating NA contenders, the team was picked up by Envy's Overwatch League franchise and was rebranded as the Dallas Fuel. Everyone on the roster was picked up by the franchise. DPS players Taimu, Effect, and Seagull, support players Chips Hyen and Harry Hook, and tank players Coco and Mickey. Additionally, they would also bring in Australian flex support player Custa to give them better communication coming from their backline, as both Harry Hook and Chips Hyen were very quiet in comms. Finally, they would also sign Canadian main tank player XQC to give their main tank position a little more flexibility. Coco was decent on Winston and Orisa, but those were the heroes that XQC excelled at. 
I imagine their plan was to groom XQC to be their primary dive tank who could fill in when they wanted to play anti-dive as well. Coco could then be used as a Reinhardt specialist as he was used to being played as, and he would also provide consistent main tank play until XQC was ready. With these nine players and the same coach that helped them to dominate in Contenders NA, it seemed like Dallas was going to be well on their way to a successful first season in the Overwatch League. Their preseason matches would continue to further that confidence, beating the Houston Outlaws 3-2 and the Florida Mayhem 3-1. Going into the regular season, they were considered the best Western team in the league and likely the only one that could stack up against the top Korean teams like the Dynasty, Spitfire, and Excelsior. Fans and analysts alike were excited to get the season underway. Unfortunately for Dallas, the beginning of Stage 1 did not quite go as planned. Four games into the season, and they still had not found their first win. And when you look at the match scores, it's pretty easy to say, oh haha, ha, Dallas bad, as they had only won two maps in their first four games. So what was going on? Well, for starters, Dallas was having difficulty finding a team identity. They were also having trouble finding a consistent starting six for their roster. It wasn't that they didn't have talented players, it was that they had too many. And they were having a hard time finding the right combination of six that they could go forward with. I think the biggest issue, however, lied in their attacking rounds. Dallas had a solid but somewhat inconsistent defense, but their attacking rounds were offensively bad. It was incredibly rare that they would finish a map with time left in the bank. Usually they would either finish in overtime or not at all. This would lead them to try and full hold maps just to get a draw. Their defense was good, but asking them to constantly make up for their failures on attack rounds was just too much to ask. They would lose maps, then therefore they would lose games. I will also say that Dallas probably had the hardest stage one schedule in the entire league. Their first four games saw them play against two 7-3 teams that would only miss the playoffs due to map differential, a 7-3 team that made the playoffs, and the 8-2 Spitfire, who went on to win the Stage 1 Finals. But in spite of the match scores and their attack round woes, three of the four matches were actually incredibly close. The game against the Dynasty may have been the best regular season match of the year. They lost to the LA Valiant, sure, but the first two maps were so close that it could have gone either way. Dallas could have just as easily won 3-1 as they lost 0-3. They took a map off the Spitfire and came ever so close to forcing that series to a Game 5. The one outlier was the match against the Outlaws, where the team just seemed to have a bit of an off day. Coco and Mickey were bullied by Muma and Cool Matt, and Linkster and Jake shut down the Dallas DPS line for the entire match. Week 3 would finally see some turnaround for the Fuel. They seemed to settle on a starting 6 finally, who would play for the entirety of their two matches that week. Apparently Harry Hook was sick, which is why Custa was playing for him, but Custa seemed to bring some great communication to the table. With him in the lineup, the team seemed much more organized, their attack runs were much better, and they looked more cohesive altogether. Additionally, they began to accept that their dive was just not good enough to reliably run. However, their anti-dive comp was one of the strongest in the league. They played it almost exclusively for both of their games in Week 3, and it worked incredibly well. Dallas would finally secure their first win in dominating fashion against an outmatched Shock team. Sitting at 1-4, and four, and most of their earlier struggles hopefully behind them, Dallas had a chance to turn their stage around. The second half of their schedule would not be as difficult as the first, but they would still be tested often. Their first test would come right away, against one of the dark horses of Stage 1, the Boston Uprising. Boston was trying to salvage their playoff hopes as well. They were only a pedestrian 2-3 and three on the season, but one of those wins had come against the formerly undefeated London Spitfire. They were also beginning to assert themselves as one of the best pure dive teams in the league. With that, the stage was set. One of the best pure dive teams versus a Dallas team that said that they felt they could counter Boston very well. The DPS battle was also the stuff of legends. Effect and Siegel versus Striker and... That one guy who also played DPS for Boston, who we are not going to talk about. If Dallas wanted to salvage their stage one, they absolutely had to win this match. But they would have to do it against a team who was in the exact same position they were, a team that couldn't afford to lose, and a team that was trying to salvage their season as well.
respect the damage now. Bombardment of balls coming straight towards him, but now it is time for that rip tire. He's the final switchy target or a high priority one of them. They couldn't quite pull it off. Dallas gave Boston everything they had. While trailing 1-2, to two, Effect put the team on his back, shutting down Boston's DPS to help full hold them on Dorado and bring the series to a map 5. They even forced Boston off of their dive comfort picks, forcing them to play a quad tank strategy to try and outbrawl Dallas on the point. Dallas's inability to play dive at a high level came back to haunt them, as it would have easily overwhelmed the slower comp that Boston was running. However, they stuck to their guns and they paid the price. They would fall to Boston 2-3, to three, and now sitting at 1-5, and five, any hopes of making the Stage 1 playoffs were pretty much done. The next two weeks were interesting for Dallas. Harry Hook would be back in the lineup, and the attacking struggle seemed to come back. Maybe Harry Hook was performing better than Custa on a mechanical level, but I think the team could have used Custa's in-game leadership. In Week 4, they would get obliterated by the Fusion 4-0, but then narrowly lose to the Excelsior 1-3. In Week 5, Effect would be absent from the lineup entirely. There was never any word as to why he wasn't playing, but the team severely missed him out there. Nothing against Time, he was a great player, but Effect was just playing at an otherworldly level. They would still manage to string two victories together though, a 3-2 win over the Shanghai Dragons and a dominant 3-1 win over the LA Gladiators. In spite of the win streak, the Fuel still finished Stage 1 with a rather disappointing 3-7 record. However, winning their last two matches gave people a lot to look forward to in the other three stages. Reflecting on the Fuel's Stage 1, Dallas was definitely a better team than their record would suggest. If I were to make a power ranking for the end of Stage 1, it would look something like this, and I would put Dallas right about here in the middle of the pack. This seems reasonable given that they played top teams extremely close most of the time, but were unable to secure any wins against them. Against middle of the pack teams, they had differing results. They beat the Gladiators handily, almost beat the Uprising, but got blown out by the Fusion. Finally, when playing teams they were expected to beat, they got the job done against the Dragons and the Shock. Some positive takeaways from Stage 1 were that, as the stage progressed, it seemed like Dallas began to find their identity as a team. Their DPS line was still one of the best trios in the league, and their tank line was improving marginally as matches went on. Coco's Winston wasn't great, but it was respectable, and his Arissa was pretty consistent. Mickey's Diva was still struggling, but his Roadhog had made massive improvements as the stage went on. Going into this project, I was honestly expecting the tank line to be a complete liability, so seeing them play as well as they did was a pleasant surprise. For support, the team had found their dedicated Mercy player with Chips Hyen, and both Harry Hook and Custa were great on Zenyatta and Lucio. On top of that, XQC would be coming back from his suspension in Stage 2, and the team was also signing DPS player AKM to the roster. There were still some concerns regarding the team moving forward though. First of all, their inability to show any signs of life on their attacking rounds most of the time was distressing. On top of that, some of the players on the roster would disappear with little to no explanation. We all know about XQC's suspension for his comment about Muma, but both Effect and Siegel would take turns disappearing from the lineup entirely. 
This resulted in the team having to come out with inferior DPS lineups when they really couldn't afford for that to happen. Finally, the tank line was improving, but they were still the weakest link on the team. Both Coco and Mickey were respectable, but frankly, that just doesn't win you matches. With XQC being a bit of a wild card and not playing much even when he was eligible, I would have liked to see Dallas possibly bring in another main tank or at least another off tank to give them a few more options. Instead, they brought in yet another DPS player to bolster the only position on the team that really didn't need any help. Granted, if Effect was already starting to experience some issues with burnout, the signing makes a little bit more sense. In conclusion, while there were some concerns about the team, they seemed to be working through most of them. Hopefully now that Dallas had their identity and their starting six figured out, they could put more focus on improving their attacking rounds. If they could do that, the future certainly would have been bright. Looking at their schedule for Stage 2, I would have predicted Dallas to improve their record by at least two wins, and likely even more than that. I would have said they should go at least 5-5, five and five, and maybe even 7-3 and three, or even 8-2 and two if everything lined up. If everything would have gone well, I would have predicted them to make the Stage 2 playoffs, but they probably would have lost in the first round. They would have easier games more often moving forward, and the beginning of their stage would not be so top-heavy with elite-level opponents. All things considered, Dallas had a lot to work on, but nobody was saying this team was bad. There was a reason to believe that this team would make quite the bounce back in Stage 2. But we all know what really happened. Thank you all so much for watching. Obviously there are three more stages to cover, and don't worry, I'm already on it. There's a lot of information that needs to be addressed in this story. I decided early on to split this video into two parts because I didn't want to leave any information out. I also didn't want this video to be close to an hour long. If you enjoyed this first video, it would mean the world to me if you left a like or a comment. This channel is brand new and I really don't have very much experience making content like this, so any kind of feedback is welcomed. If you are looking forward to part two, feel free to hit that subscribe button and turn on all notifications so you don't miss my next upload. This story is about to get really interesting, and I hope you are all as excited for part two as I am to make it for you. Until then, enjoy the Countdown Cup, and I'll see you all soon.